on this fine Sunday morning. Uh, a special welcome to our guests and visitors that are with us. A special welcome back to Joanne. Yay. Yay. <laughs> it is good to be here to celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I invite you to stand as you are able and turn to page 94, the front part of the red book. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, who in his mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. We also acknowledge the today and Hopi peoples who are the cus traditional custodians of the Flagstaff area in which we meet, and we pay respects to the elders, past and present, of all indigenous peoples of Arizona and the United States. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another, beginning with a moment of silence. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. Let us sing our opening hymn, hymn number 530. Hear, O Lord, your servants gather. <laughs>
our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us sing the Kyrie. <laughs> displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still on my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? <clears throat> then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. <clears throat> the Lord God appointed a bush and made it come over Jonah. He gave him shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, Is it better for me to die than to live? But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. 
It came into being in the night and perished in the night. And should I not be concerned about Nibia, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? <laughs> the word of the Lord. <laughs> We shall sing the song responsibly. <laughs> Thank you. 
the 20th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he set, went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again at about noon, and at about three o'clock, he did the same. And at five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last, and then going to the first. When those hired at about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled about the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made us equal to uh, you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious, because I am generous? So, the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Sisters, brothers, siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you, from the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Once upon a time, God had a dilemma named Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were known to be a vicious, arrogant, bloodthirsty people that reveled in violence, cruelty, and warfare. They were known to mutilate their captives alive. And when the victims died, the Syrians would stack the heads of the dead in a pyramid shape outside of the cities that they had conquered. As such, God had sent the prophet Jonah to proclaim a word of judgment in Nineveh. But Jonah didn't want to go. He knew that not only would the Ninevites repent, but that God would be compassionate and relent. And that was not what Jonah wanted. Jonah wanted the Assyrians dead, exterminated, punished for their, well, crimes against humanity, so everyone could sleep at night. And so he ran away, fleeing to a city in Spain on the Atlantic Ocean called Tarshish, which literally means the end of the world. As we know, Jonah didn't make it very far before he ultimately found himself in Nineveh, proclaiming God's judgment, only to see them repent and God relent, just as Jonah knew and feared would happen. And so Jonah sat down outside the great city of Nineveh and packed it. <laughs> Jonah did not want God to be gracious. Well, that's not exact, it exactly. Jonah wanted God to be gracious and merciful and loving, but only to him and his people that he cared about. He didn't want God to love those Ninevites. He wanted the people of Nineveh to get in the neck, an eye for an eye, a head for a head. It's an old story. <laughs> One that Jesus couldn't help but relate as well. The vineyard owner replied, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me to the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? 
Ultimately, God's generosity frustrated Jonah to the point that he asked for death. If God was not going to do what Jonah felt that the Ninevites deserved, then Jonah felt he might as well die. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live, he prayed. It was a selfish prayer. But in the end, Jonah's real gripe with God was not so much about God's compassion, but about control. It was a conflict over the gospel. And who owns it, provides it, manages it, and delivers it. The prophet couldn't bear that he wasn't in charge of the gospel, unable to keep it for himself and for his own people. Jonah wanted to box God in because he knew that God was a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. And so, once again, Jonah wanted to flee from his calling in the gospel, beyond Tarshish, all the way to the grave. Jonah would rather die than let God be in control. Yet even in the middle of Jonah's dour desire to die, God's provision for life sprung forth. God was now trying to save Jonah from the great evil he had slipped into, a fight with God over God's extravagant grace. Because conversation was going nowhere, God shifted tactics. God showed to Jonah his will using his own tangible creation, a plant, a worm, and the elements of nature. First, God provided a shady plant for Jonah's relief in the desert heat, a sign of God's steadfast love and care. Then God sent a worm, which destroyed the plant. Is Jonah getting God's message yet? <laughs> this is God's law talking, trying to correct his child and bring him home, just like with Nineveh. Then a hot east wind arose, probably blowing down Jonah's tent and exposing him to the blazing sun. Does he understand now? This is what torment feels like. Would, is this what he would have wished upon the Ninevites? Through it all, God was calling his prophet home. This is a story of redemption, after all. God redeeming Nineveh and also his wayward prophet. Yet through it all, God won't be told how to manage his own grace. God won't let his compassion be boxed in. To that end, God asks his prophet a question. Are you concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow? It came up into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be more concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their left hand from their right hand, and also many animals? To the bitter end, God is trying to save his errant child. And to the bitter end, we do not know if God was successful. Jonah never gives an answer. And the narrative just suddenly ends. The question remains unanswered, and we are all left hanging. <clears throat> and that becomes the point. Jonah is hanging, and so are we. We have to scratch our heads and, and, well, and answer the question for ourselves. The Lord is not only posing the question to Jonah, he is also asking us, you and me, Shall I have compassion on the great city of Nineveh? Shall I have compassion on your greatest enemy? Wait, I have to answer that? <laughs> that would imply that the, the judgment against Jonah might apply to me then as well. Do we have the guts to answer God's question? The truth is, a Jonah works in every Christian's heart, whispering his insidious message of smug prejudice empty creedalism, and exclusive solidarity. The words of the Latin author Horace prick our hearts. Why laugh? 
Change but the name, and the tale is told of you. So what does the Lord do? He sends the answer. One greater than Jonah is here, said Jesus in Matthew chapter 12. And surprise, the story begins anew. We can watch Jesus, everything he says and does, to see the answer. Compassion for Ninevites marked Jesus' ministry. Jesus taught publicly with prostitutes, socialized with sinners and tax collectors, exercised demons, healed the lame, and gave sight to the blind. Matthew describes Jesus with these words. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion. The Greek for compassion comes from the word splachna, or splachnizomai, meaning he had guts, a heart for the people, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. In Matthew 15, he called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for the people. In Mark 1, filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the leper. But Jesus' most shocking act of compassion was just after the crowds repeatedly shouted out, Crucify him! Crucify him! As he then hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Shall the Lord have compassion for that great city of Nineveh? Shall the Lord have compassion on those who crucified him? Regardless of whatever answer Jonah gave and whatever answer we give in the day-to-day -day living of our lives, Jesus Christ has the guts to answer God's question. Jesus proclaims the Lord's final definitive answer with his whole heart, written with blood on the cross. Jesus is the Father's yes to compassion, yes to love, yes to full forgiveness, yes, 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 a thousand times and forever, yes, because there is no box big enough to contain and hold back God's yes. Amen. 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 Please stand as you are able as we sing the hymn of the day. Uh, hymn number 688, Lord of Light.
Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the Church, creation, and all the needs of our neighbors. God, who is gracious and merciful, teach your Church to invite and welcome all. Lead us to be grateful for the blessing of community. Challenge your church to choose equity and compassion over judgment. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God who sends the wind and the sun, you know every worm and bush by name. Help us remember that even the humblest parts of creation are precious to you. Show us how to best care for the earth and its creatures. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, who is ready to relent from punishing, impart, impart your compassionate wisdom to legislators, judges, members of the military, and law enforcement. Give them courage to serve their communities in times of uncertainty, stress, or exhaustion. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God who saves, Direct your people who are tempted by evil ways. Protect your children from calamity and disaster. Strengthen all who are incarcerated. Encourage all who are in despair or pain of any kind. We pray especially today for Rich, Nick, Dolly, Minnie, Molina, Joe and family, Bridget and family, Sheila, Cynthia, Michael, Jess, Jeff, William, Donna, Cheryl, Kyle, Pamela, Missy, John, Julie, Caden, Jeannie, Jane, Paula, Aurora, Brenda, David, Alexandra, Elizabeth, Jacob, and Cindy. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, who is slow to anger, may we boast about the goodness of Jesus with the confidence of Paul in prison. Inspire us to find abundance in whatever vocation we are called to in the world and in service to our congregation. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for Lutheran Campus Ministry, our monthly basket recipient. May those they serve be touched by your grace through our offerings. Merciful God, receive our prayer. For what else do the people of God pray? People of Syria and Libya. Mm -hmm. For the children on the border. Ukraine and the freedom fighters there. Lord, we give you thanks for the gift of life. And in particular, we celebrate with Chris and some guy named Kurt. <laughs> As they celebrate their birthdays this coming week, Lord, bless them and us and all of our comings and in our goings. Help us to refrain from boxing you in so that we do not limit the, the flow of your grace and love in this world, for we are all, all in need of your presence and love to amend our lives and to help us to be who we are truly meant to be as your children. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God who abounds in steadfast love, we give thanks for the saints called to the kingdom of heaven. United with them in spirit, hold us firm as we labor in this life and look to the life to come. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your compassion, made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's greet one another in that same peace. <laughs>
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our joy and our privilege, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, for the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 supper Jesus took the cup and when he had blessed it and given thanks he gave it to his disciples saying take and drink this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin do this to relive me having been made one in the spirit let us pray as Jesus taught us our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Thanks be to God.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace and your everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let us sing our sinning hymn, hymn number 669. Rise up, O saints of God. 